The universe is expanding. Everything wants to get as far away from each other as possible. So on the large scale, what do you observe? Everybody is trying to go as far away from each other as possible. And that's what happens on the whole. But amongst all of this madness, somewhere lumps of mass are coming together. What's pulling them closer to each other? What makes them want to get closer and closer when the whole universe itself is expanding? Even if you enter the solar system and if you were to look around and let's say you pick up a planet and see and ask the question, what brought this planet together? What lumped this amount of mass to become what it is right now? Because we do know that the planet began or the universe began with all the elements floating around in a cosmic soup. And if you were to look at the moon and ask the question, why is the moon going around the earth? Or even why this planet itself is going around the sun? Why is it not just flying away randomly? Or if you were to look up and ask, what makes this apple fall down on this earth? What makes it fall down again if you throw it away? And all these questions begin, if you begin to raise them, in order to be able to ask this question itself, forget about answering it. Even to ask this question, you need to go back in time, so far away to the 15th and 16th centuries, where people, one of them being Copernicus, first brought out the idea that probably the earth is not the center of the universe. Because till then, that's what we believed. We believed in the geocentric model, it's called, that the earth is at the center, everything revolves around us. That's what we like to believe, don't we? Very special. But Copernicus somehow looked around and said, I don't think so. I think the sun is at the center, now, of course, we know that itself is not true, but for that time, it was a big deal. And people were burnt for this idea. The people have been thrown out, people have been punished for saying that the earth is not the center of the universe. Now, what happened after that? There was a rich man, extremely rich, born into an aristocratic family called Tycho Brahe, who decided that he's going to spend his entire life and his fortune figuring out whether this was the right thing about the world. The story goes this way. He somehow convinced the king by helping him, and the king gave him an entire island with almost 10% of the entire kingdom's money to build an observatory. And Tycho Brahe spent his entire lifetime mapping stars out without a telescope. So what did he do? He had to look up at the stars, he had people working for him, he had watchkeepers, he had watchers who kept writing down maps day in and day out. And finally he created the most accurate maps of that day because he was just not happy with the way the maps were. And Kepler was one of the people who joined him. And one year after Kepler joined him, Tycho Brahe died. That's interesting. And what did Kepler do? He stole these maps. And from there began a journey. Because what Kepler believed was also in what Copernicus said. He somehow did not accept the idea that the Earth was the center of the universe. Because it doesn't seem that way. And what began to happen was that a little few years you come down the line, a man called Galileo appears. Galileo himself begins to believe in what Copernicus says. And he invents something. Which was even called an evil instrument at that time because it showed you the truth. It was called the telescope. And what Galileo saw was this. He saw that there were certain objects which were rotating and clearly you could see that they're not rotating around the Earth. They're going around Jupiter. In other words, they're Jupiter's moons. Now, that's, that's pretty boring if you think about it right now, right? What's so interesting about that? It is interesting then because at that time, people thought everything in the universe went around the Earth in fixed glass spheres. Now, something is not going around the Earth. There's a problem here, isn't there? It's a pretty big deal. So Galileo went and pointed this out to the king, got thrown out, asked never to come back to the kingdom again for speaking against what was the current norm. So, with all these happening, what did Kepler do with the maps that he stole from Tycho Brahe? He saw all those maps and began to crunch numbers. He saw this varies this way, that varies that way. He saw all of this and what did he begin to do? He began to observe some patterns. He had no idea why they were true, but he observed these patterns. And what did he see? He saw one thing first. First of all, he saw that all the planets don't seem to be going around in circular orbits that, as it was believed before that. Till then, what did people say? Everything goes around the Earth in circles. Now, what did he say? The planets go around the Sun in elliptical orbits. Why? I don't know, but that's what it seems to be. That's what Kepler said. And that was the first law of Kepler, the law of orbits. Of course, the first law also says that the planets are going around in elliptical orbits with the Sun as one of the foci or foci, which means that the immediate next law was this. He took the planet and he saw the amount of area it sweeps in a given amount of time. So you take one, some unit of time, could be a day, could be a minute, could be a second. No matter how small you take it, if you calculate the amount of area that that planet sweeps, and by that, what do we mean? That's exactly what we mean. The area that the radius sweeps. And then you calculate the same thing at some other point of time. What you get is that at equal intervals of time, the area swept is also equal. In other words, the aerial velocity remains constant. Again, he had no idea why these were true. These were all laying the foundation for somebody really big to come up and unify them all and we'll talk about them in a while. 
The third law that he said was that if you look at all the distances of planets and all the time periods, in other words, how long a planet takes to go around the sun and how far away it is from the sun, they have a pattern. The square of the time period was directly proportional to the cube of the distance it is away from it. Now that might seem like a mouthful to you and it's not even important that you understand it completely right now. But with these three laws, what's important was that the foundation was laid. The foundation for future work to unify them all. Because of all these questions that were asked, one of the questions that was yet to be asked was the same phenomenon that makes the apple fall to the ground. Does it also keep the moon not going away from the earth? Does it also keep the earth fixed towards the sun, like not flying away from the sun? So this question had to be answered by a man who came about a hundred years later. What he did was he said something very famous. One of the most famous quotes of his was, if I could see farther than most people, it was because I was standing on the shoulders of giants. And today what we've done is seen who were the giants on whose shoulders he was standing on. And he said something. And he said that all this boils down to what I would call the universal law of gravitation. The universal law of gravitation is extremely crucial. He wrote this in his book called Principia. And in that one book, it is probably the most monumental piece ever written because the book had a statement, one that had not been made ever before. It started off this way. Every particle in the universe doesn't even matter what we say after that, does it? It's so general, it's so easy to disprove, but a man is coming out here and making a claim that is so large. It is for the first time that someone had made such a large claim and backed with so much mathematical data, 